very much, and that's pretty much my first two slides covered already. So, uh, a breakdown of Twitter's seasonal hybrid uh, extreme student deviate test. So, it comes back to t-distributions and t-tests later on. Uh, I'm Peter Tillotson, uh, Director of Acumed uh, uh, Training. Um, I love this picture, actually, for anomaly detection. Um, it was the, the most visual thing that I managed to find uh, out there. I was originally going to try to contrast Twitter's algorithm with Numenta's uh, anomaly detection uh, framework. They've got lots of online benchmarks saying how great theirs is, but as I went through the white paper, it talked an awful lot about uh, multi-layer deep networks never really got uh, onto how it works or what it did. It just basically said, trust us, we're better, and, uh, and that was about it. So I just focused this, uh, the talk entirely on just how Twitter's algorithm works. Uh, Twitter's algorithm originally uh, implemented in R is open source, available to people. My team typically works in Python. So this is a kind of um, uh, re-implementation in Python. Um, Actually, I'm not sure the implementation is on the Acumed training site. No, it is. I, I, I put it up there uh, the other day uh, with the notebooks. So, about me. Um, my data scientist, engineer, uh, researcher, trainer. Uh, I work with uh, large data sets. This is uh, slightly old in that uh, it's 12 petabytes up there. That was probably two years ago, and it's growing at about five petabytes a year, so 15 is a reasonably good, good bet. Um, uh, the data warehouses grow because we're too afraid to delete things in them. Uh, it's not 15 petabytes of high-value data uh, in there, and hopefully we can get it down. But a million events per second is fast and challenges an awful lot of today's real-time systems doing things at those rates. Uh, incurs a bunch of, of, of difficulties. I say trainer, data analytics, and Python. And I say I'm a keen and talentless mountain biker because I fall off and keep hitting trees. In fact, I fall off a lot. So I don't do that on the lead up to these. <laughs> so it's nice to get the semantics out of the way nice and early on. Something that de deviates from what's standard, an anomaly, outlier, unexpected deviant. I work a lot uh, in security, so I'm often looking for things that may be indicative of unusual behavior in somebody's account, unusual behavior in terms of access patterns, number of emails. But that's not to say anomaly detection isn't applicable in uh, marketing and a whole wide variety of different tasks. In fact, I use this to uh, to monitor, health monitor the logs as well. So I use it to try to look at uh, per account level information, but I also use it to see, actually I would expect to be getting uh, some logs coming through from my pipeline at this point in time, why is that stopped? So anomaly detection has an awful lot of wide uses, and one of the things I liked about this method is over and above the kind of Nementa and uh, neural nets approach is it, really gives you a good feeling as to why this thing is an anomaly uh, once you've found it. So, lots and lots of ways of doing anomaly detection. Um, so, curve fitting, regression, uh, polylines, uh, statistical methods, lots of different statistical methods. Actually, those first two, the intro in the slides, are going to look at those a little bit more, so I'm skipping over them a little bit at the moment. But classification typically starts off with you've got labeled data. It's associated with supervised machine learning, supervised because for a sample of data, you know what the categories are because it's labeled. And therefore, for new data, you can start, you can use the old data to learn the categories, and then on new data, you can use it to kind of add the tags to it. Clustering is typically related to non-labeled data, uh, unsupervised because you don't have any metric directly, and typically tries to use kind of mutual similarity to group things together. Um, not gonna talk too much about those. Um, probably heard a lot about Scikit. Scikit has this fabulous graphic, great implementations all the way through the, through the code. One of the things I really liked in this was the 
uh, less than 50 samples, go and get more data. I think that's always a, a reasonable bet. But interestingly, for, um, uh, from the origins of the T distribution and the T test, actually, they were trying to do work with very, very few samples. So an interesting property of T distributions. So regression. Regression is basically uh, linear regression, putting a straight line. This is a second order uh, curve fitted to data. And then I've taken the mean and standard uh, deviation uh, of this and taken the standard deviation and just plotted those bands um, around there. Anything that stands outside those bands according to a, new, a normal distribution, I'm not saying this is normally distributed, but if it were, then that would be a 5% uh, chance um, uh, of occurring. And three standard deviations, it's about uh, a quarter of a percent probability of happening. So it's slightly more, to be fair. So this is one of the very quick techniques that you can go and say anything above here starts to look like an anomaly. Then we've got a statistical method in financial markets. This is uh, a, a technique that's often referred to as Bollinger Bands. The red there is uh, a windowed mean. So you'll notice that at the beginning of the signal, there's a patch of missing data. So we take a sample and we only calculate the mean and standard deviation for this sample as it moves through the data. So every time we add a point to the front, we take a point away from the back. And as we move through, we hit large spikes. Large spikes have a huge impact on the standard deviation within that data. Now, one of the things that has been observed in the wild for security data is that um, people will artificially add in noise. And then in this kind of shadow, they will then commence their attack and work through that. It has been observed in the wild. It's not super common. It tends to be indicative of kind of adversaries who've got a fair amount of uh, knowledge uh, of what they're going after and what they're going to do. You can basically see how that operates. Always following uh, the curve. So, now to the point. Um, Twitter's seasonal hybrid ESD is a combination of time series decomposition and the generalized ESD, extreme student deviate test. So time series composition attempts to break a signal out into uh, an underlying trend, a seasonal periodic component, and kind of anything that's left over is residual noise. ESD is an awful lot like the student T test. Uh, I didn't realize, but student T, uh, the reason it's called the student T test is that um, it was popularized by a paper in 1908 by an employee of the Guinness factory in Dublin. Um, and they didn't like uh, publishing papers with their actual names on them. And so he published it under the name student. So student T test is that. He was working on very, very small samples. So the idea of this is to be able to, and with small samples, the more samples you get, the closer a student t-test becomes a normal distribution. But with very few samples, it tends to be a lot narrower. Uh, and so from that original side, actually you can work with quite low samples using Twitter's seasonal hybrid ESD. So, skip. Yep, I've got some code in here. I put this slide in more to see um, uh, the packages that are being used. We're using uh, NAB's data. So Nementa has got some benchmark, uh, anomaly detection benchmark uh, data available. This is the, the data set that it is. I'm reading it, reading it in pandas, using tables. Now, SciPy, I think, is only used to plot normal distributions. Um, let's go back. Yes, yeah, SciPy is giving us normal distributions and the plots that are coming through this. The uh, stats model API has got the uh, 
yeah, time series decomposition. And pi astronomy is where the, ge uh, the generalized ESD algorithms are coming from. So basically, the whole of the algorithm comes down to two lines of code in the next couple of slides. So our data. Our data clearly got some periodicity in, clearly got some spikes coming through in the data uh, up here. Typically, our signals in the kind of 15 uh, to 5 band with a few kind of spiking up to 30, 35, uh, 40. Uh, it's craply sampled. Um, the first sample there, I think, is uh, 10 minutes apart, followed by 5 minutes, followed by 5 minutes, followed by 25 minutes. So, as ever, often the first step is to get your data clean enough to be able to work with sensibly with algorithms. This is a plot, if people aren't familiar with this, the value uh, that we were talking about a second ago has now come over onto the x-axis. And so we've got a few uh, elements at 35, 40. Majority of our signal is in the kind of 5 to 15 range down here. It's basically the distribution of the signal. And superimposed on that is the normal distribution and the axis for the normal distribution using the sample mean and standard deviation. You can see it's broadly uh, normally distributed, but it's actually shifted a little bit, if anything. So, um, my original signal has samples kind of between 5 and 25 minutes apart. I need to resample, so I need to make some choices. If I resample at um, a cadence of 30 minutes, that would mean I wouldn't have any holes to fill, but I'd have smoothed the signal more. If I resample at 15 minute intervals, I get more of the original signal coming in, but then I've got holes of data. If I've got holes of data, I have to fill them. And so these two lines here, uh, you can see I chose 15 minutes uh, to work through. There are 19 six 15 minutes in 24 hours. So I've resampled at 15 minutes, and then I'm interpolating um, based on time. This method actually chooses the two adjacent points in time, and will just fill your, your gap with the mean of those two points. So directly kind of linear um, uh, interpolation. Oh, I forgot the interesting part there. Seasonal decomposition. Um, this is breaking out, so as I say, um, a few lines of code gives us a sampled signal. The underlying trend, there wasn't a great deal of trend, but that seasonal component is um, uh, quite clear there in the original. And then we've got whatever's left over is basically the noise. Uh, noise residual signal should be uh, closer to an, uh, normally distributed. Actually, because it's sampled, you do tend to get a narrowing. It's actually closer to a T distribution, which is what this is. But we can see mean is pretty much picking up where it should be. And we've still got uh, outliers turning up. Right, now, that's the easy bit. So generalized ESD, um, a student T test. So T distributions used for working on small samples are based on two properties. The first is a property that comes from your sample. The next is the property that comes from the distribution. So this, this version tries to find out whether or not there are n, actually I've, in here I think I call it r, different uh, anomalies within the data set. So I'm looking for, in my example, 10 anomalies within a whole data set. So this first measure is pretty much a measure of distance. So if I go back, x minus the mu. So if we take uh, the maximum value, our mean is about 0. Our maximum value is about 17 in here. So we've got that distance divided by the standard deviation, which is probably something of the order of 2.5. 
we then remove that part of the signal, we recalculate the whole distribution, and then we look for the next furthest away, which is probably this one. So we work through and we get a whole series of properties for R. Is there anything else I should have said? Yeah. So effectively, that is just sorting the signals in terms of the maximum distance. So once we've got the R statistics, we then have to calculate the lambda statistics. These are properties from uh, the T distribution. The T distribution has a factor that's related to uh, the significance threshold that we're interested in, and a factor that's related to the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom V, which is basically the number in our sample minus which of the Rs this is. So as if this is the 7th R, 10th R, 12th R, this is just making sure that we're calculating the T distribution against uh, the appropriate uh, sample size uh, and degrees of freedom. And so we end up with a, a list of lambda which correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the list of the R values. So the number of the outliers is, is simply the largest i, the largest value for which our r value is greater than the lambda value, exactly the same as the, uh, the t-test. This um, is a one-tailed test, so it's always looking at the, uh, the far end. So basically, we're looking for a sorted list of r and lambda when you hit a point where r is less than lambda, you no longer have anomalies. And the number of anomalies and the position of those anomalies are de defined by what's, what's in that set. There may be none. There may be no R less than lambda. So what does that actually look like? So that's, that's the result, basically. The um, sample signal, and then it's picking out the spikes that we'd have expected it to from the original uh, example. But it also picks out where, actually, according to the original, these are nowhere near as high as they should be. So that's the sample signal. Try to remember approximately where those are. So it's what the first, second, third, and fourth hump Let's have a look whether or not we see it on the original signal. There we go. Would you have picked those out of, as, as anomalies on that original signal? It's not obvious, is it, around there? But we're just getting a bit less signal than one would expect coming through those, those parts. One of the things I really like about the method Based on the t-test, you can get down to kind of 50 samples, kind of three days' worth of hourly data. So I don't need masses and masses of history necessarily to go through and process uh, and get reasonable stats for things. Um, it's when I've got my result and I pass that to my security analyst or somebody else, I can very quickly explain, that's the wrong way, why they're anomalies. I think this is a very good explanation of this is an anomaly because we would expect the signal to be somewhere up here, but it's actually a lot lower than that. This is, this is what we're going to go and investigate. It doesn't do lots of different variables, but an awful lot of my work actually comes down to simple time series over a single variable. I can do an awful lot with that. Right. I should have said, the uh, code and the notebooks are available on GitHub. Uh, the implementations there uh, in the notebooks, um, there's a description of the kind of training program that we're putting together slowly. 
Um, there's also uh, a notebook on regression uh, up there. So just Jupyter Notebook, straight uh, Python implementations. Um, afterwards, I may put these slides up. My, my version of the slides actually have my notes in, which may be a more useful thing to post than anything else. So feel free to correct any errors. Um, bunch of references. Do I do the diagrams? These um, were kind of looking at what happens if we use longer windows. So still a, a, a 15 minute sampling period, but we could look at longer windows to try to bring out uh, more understanding of what um, uh, the seasonal decomposition will do. Um, now, I did trial and adjustment to find uh, the previous window within there. One of the differences that's uh, implemented in the Twitter algorithm is actually trying to work out some of these things automatically for you. Um, so it will, it will go through. But if you shorten the windows significantly, an awful, in the way that um, Python's seasonal decomposition works, which is different from ours, ours uses polylines to try to uh, predict trends and uh, the seasonality. It builds a more formal model. This uses convolution, and therefore you end up with that kind of uh, trailing window. Um, you also, if you shorten the window too much, things that should be periodic just start to come through as part of uh, trend lines as, as instead. Do I have an, uh, a description, which is exactly what we see there. We start to see our trend actually taking more and more of uh, the seasonal component, and we end up with less kind of randomness uh, in our residual signal. No questions? There's a mic. I'll stand to the side because that's right. Can they Thank you. Um, I was wondering, like, um, you using the process interpolation? Yeah. So I was wondering if any of the outliers that you identified were corresponding to mm, data points that you had generated, rather than those that were originally in your data set. Yeah. I mean. The ones that could, it's unlikely for them to, would actually be where the neighboring points are already outliers, um, or at least one of them is. Uh, because if, if you're taking the mean between two points, it's unlikely that it's going to significantly change the mean and standard deviation of the sample, unless the two points next to it are already outliers. So it shouldn't do. Do you want me to put the diagram on? Maybe. The that one's probably. Right. Okay, so let's say there are three, six, eight cycles, and let's say that uh, in cycle seven, one of those spikes uh, was one of the was one of the outliers. So, yeah. Yep. So let's say that's a, an outlier. That's a real outlier based on the original data set. Yeah. Um, but was uh, detected uh, use, uh, using as a benchmark. Um, interpolated data points from previous uh, cycles. Um, so how, how would you go about it? Like, you're going to explore all data you're points anyway. You're, you're thinking of if, if, if this continues this way, and these are basically appearing down here, uh, and then I've got a hole further up there. But whatever I'm interpolating is always going to be between two, mm -hmm. uh, two other points. So unless they are up here or down here, or in this case, kind of 
I mean, this, this is the most likely area where the seasonal, seasonality to kind of picks out um, a gap, but you've already got something that's relatively low, and so it, it may pick it out. Um, to be honest, my aim is to try to avoid generating too many false positives, mm. but I'm always going to end up falling back on uh, human analysts with a click button to say, yes, this is a problem, and no, this isn't a problem. Um, the alternative uh, would be, as I was saying before, to just say it's a 30-minute sampling period. I don't need to do any interpolation. Uh, look at the data on, on a larger window. In fact, one of the examples that I work on in uh, real life, I've got batch data that's clearly being sent to me via a cron job. And if I look at it hourly, um, it gives a really stupid result because I've got one job and then there's kind of midday, there's another job that's appearing in and then, but if I look at that daily, for the health monitoring, it's perfect. I know exactly when that thing stops sending me data because I don't get anything in that big day bucket. Mm. So if you're starting to get more problems coming through caused by interpolation, which I'd have thought would be rare, um, actually just going to a bigger bucket and saying, I don't mind. But for me, there are cases where, yeah, I do want to know within 15 minutes if something's happened, and that's the trade-off I'm making. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to know sooner so that I can pull a breaker on a network or, or whatnot if this is a serious problem. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One, um, because you had time series, and I'm assuming it's going to be non-stationary, um, would it, did it not cross your mind to put it into a non-stationary format in case you had like a multiplicative trend, and then you'd have anomaly just because of natural trend progression? And then two, um, if you had dual seasonality, how would you account for that? So if you had weekly sales and then an annual trend? And actually, sorry, my third question is, um, also, would you not uh, kick in this package? Can you not? Uh, I've, I've played with it, and you can't put in regresses. And uh, what I mean is, anomaly could just correspond to, say, a, a, a special promotion day. And if you had an external covariant, which you had, say, a promotion sales and whatnot, you would realize anomaly isn't an anomaly, it's just marketing spend on that day, et cetera. Yeah. Um, there are uh, the, the dual seasonality, as long as you've got a sufficient window on it will probably work this one rather than ours because it works on uh, convolution rather than uh, polyline fitting. It will probably pick it out uh, in terms of the different methods. Um, there are more complex uh, ways that you can start going about uh, the task. Um, so fitting uh, better mathematical models to the curves in the first place, et cetera, et cetera. One of the benefits I have for this is that because it's based on a relatively short sample, or can be, um, I can actually start to embed it into real-time systems with relatively few calculations and relatively simple calculations. So I can actually start to embed this, not necessarily quite at the a million events per second with data flowing through it, but not far off, um, which massively simplifies uh, things. So it, it, it's got very few complex moving parts. That answers the question. Kind of avoids it, but. <laughs> um, thanks very much for your talk. Um, my question is, um, is there a risk of, um, you, we saw earlier that there were some anomalies earlier on that were yeah. under, um, the algorithm saw them as anomalies because they were under what they should be. Yeah. But is there a risk that that's only because it's picked up true anomalies later that were over, which is being incorporated into the algorithm um, when you do the ranking, so it makes these look low because of something that's happened after the time. So it's kind of retroactively identifying something that wasn't an anomaly at the time as an anomaly. Yeah, when, when it's calculating the T distributions, uh, you're doing so with the removal of those samples from the underlying data. So, no. 
because, because you take those, those chunks out, you say, I've said this is an anomaly, I can, I can lose that, have we got any others on, on recalculating? So the answer is no. All right, thanks. There was a question over here as well. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have more statistical question. Um, so you're using this like t-test, like in this you're defining this R, but it's based on t-test really to identify your outliers. Have you sort of using Cook's distances, for example, which a kind of standard way of uh, like uh, detecting dis distances from your um, like regression line in this way, for yeah, example, no. for residuals? No, uh, I mean. Th th as, as the title was, I, I, I looked at Twitter's algorithm and just took that. Um, but there are, I mean, uh, measuring distance, measuring similarity, most of the, the techniques clustering it all come down to that fundamental property of how and what distance are we going to measure in this problem. Um, some of them doing more, more variables, some of them in, in this case. So, yeah, there are loads and loads and loads of different calculations which typically prove better in some circumstances and worse in another circumstance. What, again, going back to the, the, the future of where this gets implemented is with data flowing through the algorithm and me saying, I'm going to say the window is 72 hours. My history is such and such. In that 72 hours, I can take one day for kind of uh, learning or two days for learning and one day for finding an anomaly. Um, with the T parameters, they're, they're quick and easy to, to calculate. I suspect uh, the other algorithms are as well. Yeah, I, I just think that um, you could use your historical data, as you say, you could yeah. train it on, uh, for example, some period of time and then apply it uh, like, you know, later. But um, I think it may be that as easy as something just looking at your uh, like residuals yeah. uh, without any in, even estimating anything, you could just detect the region. Um, I mean, normal region in status would be minus three plus three, but I think according to your data, it probably will be around minus seven plus seven. I mean, yeah. what, what, yeah. what we've seen. Um, so probably you don't even need to estimate like any t statistics or anything. You could just based just on historical data see that if it's outside of this region, you would probably want to have a look at it, you know, first yeah. at this particular observations. I'd be really interested in it. And we could perhaps do the next presentation together. And we could do <laughs> our better than Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I just, yeah, it's very interesting talk. And I think um, you kind of have like a control chart. And I think in healthcare, it, particularly they use lots of health like control charts to identify the spikes and yeah. they're particularly interested in the spikes because this is potentially something like a good molecule uh, to explore further so they have lots of data and they want only to identify small spikes yeah. which i think may be applicable to your situation as well yeah and as, as, as i say i think looking at the stats and then using kind of uh, implementations for recursive mean and recursive standard deviation uh, having a bit of a tweak so that you're, you're doing the sample changing I think I could get this near uh, the hundred sorry near the million events per second type of range as well um, I don't think it's hard to get there okay thank you very much okay. thank you good yes. talk Anybody else? are there any other questions Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much to Peter Tillotson.